are thankful for your presence tonight. We're excited to be here, and we're very thankful for the invitation to spend this week talking to you about the good news. The good news that we want to discuss tonight is that our Lord built his church. There are many misunderstandings about the church. These misunderstandings cause people to not appreciate the church and treat her with the high regard that they should. And sometimes those are non-members, but unfortunately sometimes those are members. The church is not a building. The Lord's church is not a denomination. The church is God's spiritual body comprised of those who have obeyed the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and verse 9 refers to the church and those citizens in many ways. The word church means called out. The word church is used in at least three different ways in the New Testament. It is used to describe the universal body of believers, everyone who is a member, Matthew 16, 18, and 19. It is used also to describe a local congregation of God's people, not unlike Hillcrest. You could read that in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, the church of God, which is at Corinth. And then it's used with regards to a specific assembly of those believers, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18, when you come together in the church, the assembly of God's people. Properly understood, it's no overstatement to say that, quite frankly, in the Bible, the church is everything. If you understand the church, you will appreciate the importance and singular nature of the church. If you understand the church, you will want to become a member of the Lord's church, if you understand it. If you understand the church, well, you will never leave the church. I'm always amazed when people talk about individuals leaving the church. Really, you must not understand it if you leave the Lord's church. If you understand the Lord's church, then you will fully appreciate the good news that he built it. But it's probably a lack of understanding that causes people not to appreciate the church. And that could be because people may not grasp fully just how many things they would need to understand. For instance, to appreciate the Lord's church, you would have to understand and appreciate the Bible. You see, the Bible is the inspired word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. The scripture is God breathed, all of it, full, complete, verbal, plenary, complete and full, verbally, the very words, and inspired, God breathed. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3. Peter adds the thought that it never came or originated in the mind of man. No human being ever thought up scripture. That's Peter's point. To appreciate the church, you'd have to understand how the Bible works, how revelation works. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 to 13, you would have to appreciate and understand that without the Scripture, you couldn't know the mind of God. No man can read another man's mind. That's Paul's point. No eye has seen, no ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts or minds of men the things which God has prepared for them, but God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man. You'll want to underscore that part. The things of God no man knows. In other words, you couldn't know about the church if God didn't reveal it. So to appreciate the church, you'd have to begin with the appreciation of the fact that God revealed the church in his revelation. But then secondly, you'd have to appreciate and understand the theme of the Bible. When you do grasp and appreciate the inspired word of God in which the church is revealed, well, you'd have to understand what is it about. The very theme you'll read is the salvation of man through Jesus Christ to the glory of God. While this book contains history, it's not a history book. While it contains pre-scientific information, it's not a science book. No, every time you pick up this book, you're reading a story of redemption. You're reading how God brought Jesus to save the world. In fact, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said God did. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 19, Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then he says this, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, to know, to understand that, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That's what the book's about. 
God is in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. To appreciate the church, you'd have to appreciate the theme of the Bible. But beyond that, to appreciate the church, you'd have to understand the individuals in the Bible. When you open up God's inspired word and you start reading, there are individuals in here. You're going to need to know them, beginning with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the divine nature, Acts 17, 29, Colossians 2 and verse number 9, Romans 1 and verse number 20. The Godhead, you'd have to know each member, but you'd also have to know Satan or the angels human beings, animals, you'd have to know the individuals about whom you're reading as you work your way through this book if you're going to appreciate the church. To appreciate the church, you'd have to understand the problem of the Bible. You see, this book is about a solution because there's a problem. You'd have to know what the problem is if you're going to appreciate the church and its solution. What's the problem? Sin. What's the problem? Sin and its consequence, death. You see, that's humanity's problem, not God's problems, actually. God has neither sin and God can't die. That's not his problem. It's our problem. You'd have to appreciate that. But beyond that, you'd have to appreciate that God alone has the solution for your problem. Understanding the church and the Bible is to understand God's solution to the problem of sin and how he, through Christ, would overcome that. When do we find that sin? Well, that's in Genesis chapter 3. You know, that's not very far into your Bible. You'll read chapter 1, you'll read chapter 2 about God's creation. Chapter 1 tells you how he did it or that he did it. Chapter 2 fills in some details about what he did. And by chapter 3, we already have our problem. When Adam and Eve sinned, death came into the world, and that passed on to all men. Everyone after Adam and Eve will die. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12, the Bible says, Death passed upon all men, and therefore all men will die. Now you are born into this world. You're not born a sinner. But when and at some point in your life, if you sin, then you have a problem. And that is a problem for which you have no solution. In fact, the Bible says you are now under penalty. What is the penalty for your sin? Death. But not simply physical death. Oh, no. See, you are an eternal spirit. And therefore, when your spirit leaves your body, your spirit keeps living. It's got to live somewhere. And so, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. When you die physically, Hebrews 9 and verse number 27, the Bible says that gives you a ticket to judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. Now that that soul has reached eternity and you stand before God, you will be judged. What will you do? Revelation 20 and verse 21 and verse number 8 says, All liars and all of those listed will have their part in the lake of fire which burneth forever and ever and ever. Friends, you have a problem. Let me ask you this. What's your solution? You see, if you don't appreciate your problem, you can't appreciate the church. The proverb writer says in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 9, Who can say I've made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. Sin creates a gulf deeper, longer, and wider than we could cross. We could do nothing to bridge the divide between us and God. It is a lack of understanding that leads to one not appreciating the Lord's church. To appreciate the problem, to appreciate the church, you'd have to understand the singular nature of the church. Now, how would you do that? You'd have to then understand the purpose of God. You see, God had a plan in place before he made man. And therefore, before the problem was lived out by Adam and Eve, a solution was already in place. What was the solution? The Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 9. Paul says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known, listen to it, by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose of the Lord. The eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. Go back to in the beginning. And when you get to Genesis 1, in the beginning, take one step backward. What's before the beginning? That would be eternity. What's in eternity? Well, that's just God alone. God alone is from beginning to end. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. What is it that Paul said in Ephesians 3? He says that God purposed something 
in eternity, before there was a you, before there was a beginning, before there was a problem, there was a purpose. What was the purpose? Paul says it's the church. It is a lack of understanding. It is a lack of understanding that leads people not to appreciate the Lord's church. You see, God has a plan before their sin. And now that sin is in the world, Genesis chapter 3, what you're reading in your Bible is simply God's execution of the plan he had in eternity. Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 is creation. Genesis chapter 3 is sin. Genesis chapter 4 is sacrifice. Genesis chapter 5 is a genealogy. Genesis chapter 6 is a salvation, 6 to 10. When we come off the ark, there are eight people alive. The rest of the world has been judged. Those eight people began to over and disperse over the world and repopulate the world. There are three genealogies in Genesis 10 and 11. There is Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Each is given their line and their genealogy. There is twice in Shem. One will begin, Japheth, and then Ham, and then Shem. And then we'll go through the rest of the chapter, get through the Tower of Babel, and return to Shem. Now, why will we do that? Because if you start in that second genealogy where Shem is, you will read down through chapter 11 and you'll slide over to the end and you will come to Terah, the father of Abel. And this is the nature of the Bible. It's what it does. It moves God's plans forward. And for the next 12 to 25 in the book of Genesis, we'll talk about Abel. Why is Abraham significant? Because God makes him three promises. He promises him the land, Canaan. Promises him the nation, Israel. And he promises him a seed, Christ. These promises will be spoken again to his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. Genesis 26, 1 to 3 and 28, 13 and 15. Jacob will then have his name changed to Israel. Jacob will have 12 sons, Israel will, each one ahead of a tribe. And the 12 tribes of Israel will come from them. From Jacob's sons, God will choose Judah, Genesis 49, 10. From Judah, God will choose the house of Jesse, 1 Samuel 16, 1. From the family of Jesse, God will choose David, 1 Samuel 16, 12, and 13. We will close the book of Genesis with God's people in Egypt. In the Exodus, God will bring them out. They will be brought out of Egyptian bondage. If you're going to appreciate the church, you'd have to appreciate Old Testament Israel. You'd have to understand this nation to appreciate the New Testament nation. God only had one people people in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 4 through 6, after those people come out of Egyptian bondage, after they cross the Red Sea, chapter 15, 16, 17, there's water, there's food, and then we get near the mount. And just before they reach the mount and get the law, God says this, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, listen to it, above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Friends, begin to read your Bible from this point and appreciate this fact. There is no nation in the Old Testament like this nation. There has never been another physical nation like the nation of Israel. They were God's chosen, special, unique people, as he says, above all people. Take the time. In fact, if you have your Bibles, bear with me for a few minutes. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 4. Read a few passages. We don't have time to read them all, but you should. Listen to what Moses says with regards to this nation so that you could appreciate the, the singular nature and importance of this, in the, this group of people. Verse number 30 of chapter 4, Moses says, or verse number 32, Indeed, ask now concerning the former days, which were before, uh, before you since the day that God created man on the earth, and inquire from one end of the heavens to the other, and ask, has anything been done like this, uh, this great thing, or has anything been heard like it? What's Moses talking about? He's talking to the nation of Israel, 
And he says to them, now, I want you to do something. I want you to go back in your mind and ask around, has anything like this ever been done? What's he talking about? He says, well, first of all, he says, go back to creation and then come forward to this day. And then he says, and check all over the world and see, has there ever been anything like this? Like what? Well, just keep reading. Verse 33, Moses says, has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard and survived? Or has God tried to go take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war, by a mighty, has it ever happened before? No, it's never happened. Has any nation ever assembled at a mountain and heard God? No, it never happened. Has God ever gone into one nation, this nation put that nation into bondage? Has God ever gone in and took them out? Never happened before. But it did here. Why did he do that? He made those promises to Abraham, a land, a nation, and a seed, and God will keep his promises. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, the first five verses, notice again what Moses says to this group of people. Moses summoned, verse number 1 says, all of Israel. Hear, and he said to them, hear, O Israel, the statutes, the ordinances I am speaking to you this day in your hearing, that you may learn and observe them carefully. The Lord our God made a covenant with us. You'll want to note the us that follows. The Lord made a covenant with us at Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers. Who were their fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't make the covenant with them. No, he made it with us, with all of those of us who are alive here today. The Lord spake to you face to face at the mountain from the midst of the fire. And while I was standing between the Lord and you at that time, there's never been any nation like this nation. What happened to the rest of the nations? You'll want to read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Actually, chapter 1 to the end of, 18 to the end of the chapter. You'll read phrases like this. God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them over. You'll want to read Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, where Paul says that at that time you were Gentiles in the flesh. He says you were alienated from the covenants of promise. You had no hope, and you were without God in the world. There is a nation that has hope in the world. It's Israel. Every other nation, Paul says, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. To appreciate the church, you'd have to understand this nation. Because the New Testament talks about the nation of the Lord just like it does this nation. But before we get there, to appreciate the Lord's church, you'd have to understand prophecy. You'd have to appreciate that. You see, God prophesied the church would come. In 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 to 13, God said who would build the church. David wanted to build God's house. That's the first part, first 11 verses of that chapter. God came to David and said, you will not build me a house, but I'll build you one. When or who will build it? God said, when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will raise up thy seed after thee. You will want to note that. I will raise up thy seed after thee which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I know that Solomon built the house in Israel, but that's not the one being spoken of. This will also be David's seed, and his kingdom will live forever. God tells us who will build the house, but not only that. God tells us when the house will be built. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 44, in the midst of talking about that image with those four parts to it, he gets to the final nation after the head of gold, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians and the Grecians. After that, he gets to the last kingdom. And he says, in the days of these kings, that is, when Rome reigns and rules, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. A kingdom will not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And again, it shall stand forever. The next time you find yourself concerned about whether or not the church is going to fall apart, go astray, cease to exist, go back and read the prophets. If you're going to appreciate the church, appreciate what the prophet said about the church. He tells us who will build it. He tells us when it will be built. But not only that, he tells us what will happen when it's built. Joel chapter 2, 
verses 28 beginning down to verse number 32, the prophet Joel said, it shall come to pass afterward, hear that as in the last days, just like the other prophet said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Also, upon the servants of my handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Sun will be turned to darkness, moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, please note that, it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant of whom the Lord shall call. He will tell us who will build it. He will tell us when it will be built. He will tell us what will happen when it will be built. But not only that, he'll tell us where it will be built. Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse number 2, the Bible says it shall come to pass in the last days. That the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. For he will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. If you were a Jew living in the first century world, you would have known these prophecies and you would have been like many others in anticipation of the coming Messiah. You remember in Matthew chapter 2 when Herod wanted to know where is he that is to be born king of the Jews? There's anticipation. There's people wondering. Sure enough, they went to the prophets. They said in Bethlehem. They read Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. It's what they would have done and they would have also known this prophecy. Before the Messiah come, before the one who's going to come and build God's house, there will be a forerunner that prepares the way. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 3, the Bible says, The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. If you're going to appreciate the Lord's church, friends, you'd have to understand the totality of the Bible. You'd have to understand the inspiration of the scriptures. You'd have to understand the way revelation works. You'd have to understand the promises and the problem and the solution and the purpose and ultimately the prophecy. You'd have to understand all of these things by way of review. God purposed this in redemption, in, in eternity. And man sinned and death came with it and then God began to execute his plan. We can see the plan unfold, the promises to Abraham, the land, the nation, the seed. By Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 to 45, we will have the land and we will have the nation. The only thing lacking is the seed. The rest of the Old Testament will go all the way through preparing the way for the seed to come. We don't have to guess about who the seed is because the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, and verse number 16, that he's talking about Christ. He says, not unto seeds as of many, but unto thy seed, which is Christ. You see, the prophets prophesied Christ's coming. But when he comes, what would he do over and over and over again? They said he will build God's house. He will establish God's kingdom. When the Messiah comes, the kingdom comes. When the Messiah comes, the house comes. When the Messiah comes, the church comes. The New Testament then opens by telling us, first of all, that the Messiah is here. Those 17 verses you read in Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 1 beginning down to verse 17, that's not filler. That's intended to connect us, make us aware that the one who is coming Jesus Christ is the seed, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's how Matthew 1, 1 opens. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham, he is the fulfillment of the seed. He is the seed of Abraham. Also, son of David, he's the king. He's royalty. And Matthew treats him that way in that gospel account. So you read Matthew 1, Matthew 2, and by Matthew 3, the forerunner is here. 
John the Baptist was the forerunner for Christ's coming, just like Isaiah said. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, which is exactly what we read in those days, Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But we don't have to wonder if this is it. Because the very next verse says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The prophets have done the prophesying. The Messiah has come. The forerunner has run before him. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, John's preparation. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, Jesus is baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew chapter 4 and verses 1 to 13, our Lord is tempted and he triumphs and overcomes. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 17, Jesus says, For that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, all you got to do is keep reading. Well, what's the kingdom? Now Jesus is saying, it's near. By Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse number 13, as Jesus is walking in the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asks his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They respond. Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But who say ye that I am? Simon said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If a person doesn't understand and appreciate the Bible, the purposes of God, the eternal, the problem of sin, the prophet, yeah, maybe you wouldn't understand the church. But if you understand the entirety of God's plan and purposes, friends, all you could do is appreciate the Lord's church. You see, before Jesus' death, the kingdom, the church, it's always coming. That's what everybody in the Old Testament is saying. He's coming. And when he comes, he will build it. After the death of Christ, after his burial, after his resurrection, you open up Acts chapter 1 and you start reading. And when you do, you will find these words. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given them commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. Imagine that, if you will, for just a moment. Jesus didn't go straight back to heaven. Mm -mm. Not after he rose from the dead. He spent forty days with his apostles. I wonder what they were talking about. I wonder what was on his mind. I wonder what he was preparing them for. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to figure it out. All you have to do is just keep reading. Because the next phrase says, he was seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. All of eternity, God has been working the plan out from the beginning and seeing entrance into the world. And we have now arrived at the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord, 40 days with his apostles. And before he ascends, Acts 1, 9 through 11, he tells them, now you wait in Jerusalem. They are there waiting in Jerusalem. What will happen next? They will choose a new apostle. And then we will begin Acts chapter 2. That who will build it? Well, Jesus said he would. Where and when and all of those factors, we'll find them right there in Acts chapter 2. The apostles received power from the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what Jesus said would happen. You tarry in Jerusalem until you endure with power from on high. But that's also what Joel said would happen. 
the spirit would be outpoured. That's exactly what he had. When the kingdom would come, Mark chapter 9 and verse number 1, it would come within the lifetime of some of those that stood there, and it would come with power. And now, Acts chapter 2 in the first four verses, the power has come. There's another noteworthy thing, and that's verses 5 to 6. Isaiah said, all nations will flow into it. You know who is present in Acts chapter 2, verse 5 and verse number 6. All nations are present. Daniel said it would be in the last days. That's exactly what they say, Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 22. They quote that passage. They quote Joel, and they say that. In fact, they said, Joel did, it's when the Spirit will be outpoured. You know that passage we read back there in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 down to verse 32. It's quoted here in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 17. The apostle Peter and the others say this, and it shall come to pass. It shall come to pass in the last days. But, but go back one verse. Verse number 15, Peter says, these men are not drunk as you suppose since the third hour of the day. And then he says this, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What's happening here in Acts chapter 2? Exactly what Joel said would happen. Peter says, this is that. We don't have to guess about what the prophet meant because the inspired apostle Peter tells us this is what he meant. And then Peter quotes it. Peter says, it shall be in the last days. God says, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. You know what had just happened? The spirit had been outpoured. Peter said, this is it. But when the spirit is outpoured, that's when the kingdom will come. Peter says, this is it. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, old men dream dreams. Even on bond slaves, both men and women, I will pour in those days, pour out my spirit. And I will show in those days, and they shall prophesy, and there will be great wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. Sun will be turned in the darkness, the moon in the blood. Peter said, this is it. Not 2,000 years later, no. This is it. Where? Right here in Acts chapter 2. What does he say in verse 21? It shall come to pass. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, Joel said, we'll be delivered. Peter says, we'll be saved. There's salvation here. Where? Right here in the gospel, where the good news was preached. In fact, it'll be preached next. Verse 22, beginning, Peter says, men of Israel, now that I've gotten your attention with prophecy, now that you understand that this is what we've been anticipating, this is what we were, let me say this, men and brethren, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you a God by signs and miracles and wonders which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. This man being delivered by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God. You should read that as eternal purpose. He says you delivered him and you have crucified him with wicked hands. But God raised him from the dead. He has been raised up again, having been loosed from the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. You know, Peter had an astute audience of Jews there. These individuals didn't come for the establishment of the church. No, they came for the feast day. And while they were there, the church broke out. The gospel was preached. They didn't know this was that. Peter and the apostles did, though. And they began to quote to them passage after passage after passage, prophet after prophet. They've already quoted Joel. But note what they do next. Acts chapter 2 from verse 25 down to verse 29. David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh shall also rest in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. That's Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. David, the prophet, said that. But who was he talking about? Notice what Peter says next. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, he is both dead and buried. His sepulcher is with us this day. And so because he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to see, listen to 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 14, your seed, he has set one of his descendants on his throne. Who is it though? He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. When 2 Samuel 7, you won't build me a house, I'll build you a house. And I will put your seed on the throne. When will I do that, David? When you are asleep with your fathers. That's exactly what Peter says. David is dead. He's buried. 
wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about Jesus. What's happening here? The church is beginning. What church? The Lord's church. The one that was purposed in eternity. The one that was promised to Abraham. The one that was prophesied by the prophets. The who, the when, the where, the what. It's now here. The one that John would be the forerunner. The one that Jesus himself will build. It's here. And they're preaching it. It's the kingdom. The king began his reign, chapter 2, verse 33 to 34. He says of Jesus, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he says himself, more prophecy, more psalms. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at your right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel that know that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, he is both Lord and Christ. You can't have a king without a kingdom. He is exalted. He sits on his throne and he reigns over his kingdom. When they heard this, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Thousands of years they've been waiting. Generation after generation after generation. At last, John has come. Jesus has come. He's died, been buried, ascended. The Spirit has come. The preaching has gone forth. You know where they are? They're in Jerusalem preaching this message. In the last days, there is only one church that fulfills all of these things. Before Acts 2, the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is near. After Acts 2, the kingdom's here. It's established. In fact, by the time we end this chapter, verse 38, they will tell them, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. By verse 41, the Bible will say, then they that gladly received his word were baptized on the same day. There was added unto them about 3,000 souls. Down in verse number 47, the Bible says they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to the church daily those that were being saved. The Apostle Paul will write in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 13 that you are translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. In Revelation 1 and verse number 9, John will refer to himself as your brother in the tribulation and in the kingdom. In fact, those who enter the kingdom, they enter it the same way those who enter the church. They say, repent and be baptized. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 12, they enter the kingdom through the operation of God through baptism. In fact, the church is the house of God. 1 Timothy 3, verse number 15 and 16. Paul said, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church doesn't have a proper name. It has scriptural designations, all ultimately pointing to Jesus as her owner. The churches of Christ. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you, Romans 16, 16. Somebody say, well, it doesn't have to be called churches of Christ. That's right, because Jesus is divine. He's deity. And therefore, sometimes, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse number 2, it's called the church of God, which is that calling. Well, Jesus is not simply God. Well, that's true. He's also the firstborn never to die again. And so in Hebrews 12, verse 23, it's called the church of the firstborn. But he purchased it with his blood, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. And so it's called the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Friends, if you understand the church, you shouldn't be a member of any other church than this one. You shouldn't be a member of a church that didn't start in Jerusalem. That's the way the Lord's church started. You, you shouldn't be a member of a church that didn't start in the first century in the last days. You, you shouldn't be a member of a church that didn't start on the first Pentecost after Christ's resurrection. He spent 40 days talking to his apostles about the kingdom. You shouldn't be a member of a church that didn't start by the preaching of the apostles. That didn't start with the Holy Spirit being outpoured with power. That didn't fulfill prophecy. That didn't start when Rome was ruling. That can't be read in the Bible. Check the name of your church. Compare it to scripture. Research who started your church. Research where it started. It's out there. It's available. If it's a Protestant group, you're not going to go back much more than 500 years. 1,500, 1,600. You're not going to go back much further than that. 
If it's the Catholic Church, you go back to about 606, Boniface claiming himself to be the, the universal bishop. Let me ask you this. What was there before that? What was there before the Council of Nicaea in the 325? What was there before that? I can tell you exactly what it was. It was this one. It was the only one you can read in your Bible. Sometimes people get upset and they say things like, well, you can't tell me. Listen, friends, it ain't me telling you. I've walked you from Genesis all the way over here to the book of Acts. God only had one plan, and that was only one church. Take what's been said tonight and compare it to your church. God's not the author of confusion. The church is God's spiritual Israel. In fact, it's one of the reasons that sometimes God's own people don't understand the church. Because sometimes God's own people start talking like the church is just another denomination. You know, our tradition. You know, our heritage. Friends, that's nonsense. That's a person who doesn't understand the church. I suggest it to you that you need to understand Old Testament Israel. And here's why. You have your Bibles. Look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 16. Listen to how the Apostle Paul refers to God's people in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 16. Paul says, it's near the end of that book, beginning in verse number 15, he says, For in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Let me ask you this, friends, who do you think that is? He's not talking about Old Testament Israel. He's talking about New Testament Israel. He's talking about the church. And how does he refer to him as God's Israel, the Israel of God? What do we know about Old Testament Israel? There was only one nation. What do we know about Old Testament Israel? There was only one people. What do we know about Old Testament Israel? They were God's chosen above every other nation. That's what we know about them. Now God turns to the New Testament, his church, and says, that's my Israel. In fact, not the only thing that's said. In Romans chapter 2, the end of that chapter, Paul refers to Christians as Jews. Romans chapter 2 and verse 28, spiritual Jews, of course. But that's how he closes the chapter. He says with regards to those who are saints, in Romans chapter 2 and verse number 28, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, nor circumcision that which is of the heart and the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit and not by the letter, and his praise is not from man but from God. He's talking to Christians. And he says they are God's circumcision. They are God's people. It's not the only place he says it, though. He says it there in Galatians 6.16. He says it here in Romans 2. And then he says again in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you and to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. And then he says this, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. If you don't understand Old Testament Israel, well, that's why you wouldn't understand New Testament Israel. Let me ask you this. Who would go back into the Old Testament and say, oh, yeah, that nation was like every other nation? Who would do that? Who would go back into the Old Testament and say, oh, yeah, there's no difference between Moses and Balaam and Balak? And, and that, no, there's no difference. No, the Canaanites are just like the Israelites, one in the same. Nobody who understands the Bible would do that. And then God takes that exact same concept where, of all things, the exodus is being called out. And the word church, ecclesia, means called out. And those people belong to God. Let me offer up three more points, friends, and we'll close tonight. First of all, considering a concern. Sometimes people get offended when we speak of one church. To those individuals, I would like to suggest to you this. Number one, we certainly never intend to offend. But number two, one people or one place of salvation is not limited to the New Testament. It's as if God tries to prepare humanity for the concept. As early as Genesis 6, let me ask you this. How many arks were there built? If you say one, you got it right. Let me ask you this. How many people were saved? You know, it may be the case that we are not imaginative enough to try to appreciate that quite possibly there were millions and millions of people on the planet at the time. And I just heard one person, one preacher recently describe, can you imagine what it would have, must have looked like when Noah at last was able to take off the lid of the ark? What do you suppose he would have seen out there in the water? When the waters receded, when he was able to at last come off the ark, 
I don't imagine that you think it was just clean and pristine and pretty out there, do you? What happened to all those people? What happened to all those people? Jesus would say the flood took them all away. I would imagine there was quite a cleanup after the ark. Eight souls, whole world lost. The idea of one place of salvation is not unique, not even close. One nation belonged to God. Exodus 19, 4 through 6, you are my people above all people. God said that. One law given to the children of Israel for the homegrown person and the stranger. If you were in Jericho, how many houses had salvation in it? Just one, Rahab's house. If you were Naaman and you needed your leprosy clean, how many rivers could you go to? Not Parfa and Abana, just one, the Jordan. The idea that God would take one place and put salvation there and then tell everybody else, get there, it's not a new concept by the time we get to the Lord's day. Number two, the composition of the church. The church, the kingdom, is comprised of two sides. The first part is the divine side. That is the perfected, perfection part. God's plan and purposes. Christ's spiritual sacrifices, his actual sacrifice, and then his spiritual body. The blood of Christ, the work in redemption. That's one side of the church. The other side of the church is comprised of humans. Certainly not perfect. Growing in grace. Sometimes we sin. And of that side, there's no claim of perfection. Sometimes we misbehave. And sometimes our actions cause people to misunderstand. They disparage the church based on the human side. Sometimes people leave the church based on the human side. Friends, here's what you should understand, young people in particular. Older people, too, let me assure you this. No action or inaction taken by the human side ever disparages the divine side. Nothing any human does will ever contradict, overturn the divine side of the Lord's church. You and I are imperfect. We make no claim. 1 Corinthians, if the New Testament epistles tell us anything, it's that the human side of the church struggles. 1 Corinthians, Galatians, uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, James, and all of the epistles, the church struggles. We acknowledge that. We admit that. We own that. And still, the Bible refers to Corinth as the church of God, which is at Corinth. Number three. Clearing up a misunderstanding. We in the Lord's church are not asking you to join our church. Sometimes people ask me, well, Eric, where's your church? I try to be as kind as I possibly can when I tell them I don't have one. We don't teach our traditions are better than yours. That's not what we're saying. We aren't asking you to leave your denomination and come into our denomination. That's not what we're saying. In fact, I would urge members of the Lord's church to be careful how we talk about the Lord's church so that we don't talk in denominational terms and give people the wrong impression. I am not a Church of Christ preacher. I'm a gospel preacher. If you are a member of the Lord's church, you are not a Church of Christ. You're a Christian. We are teaching, I am preaching tonight, that the Bible teaches there's only one church in the Bible. The owner of that church is Jesus Christ. The one who determines her teaching is Jesus Christ. The one who determines the beliefs is Jesus Christ. The one who determines her practices is Jesus Christ. The one who adds people to his body is Jesus Christ. God's eternal purpose is the church that Christ built. And if you are not in Christ's church, then friends, you need to leave the one you're in that was built by some man or some woman and you need to get into his church. Makes you wonder if one understood it, why would anyone build an institution in opposition to the one you read in the Bible? It's why Jesus will say to people, 
religiously. I never knew you. I never approved of you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Christ doesn't approve of men starting their own churches, determining their own plan of salvation, worshiping any way that they see fit, living the life that they choose, and then when life is over, standing before him in eternity and demanding that he take them to heaven. No. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the savior of the body. He will only save his body. And so we beg you tonight, if you can't find your church in the Bible, if your church is not the eternal purpose of God that you can read about and walk yourself all the way through the Bible as we did tonight, we beg you, come out of that church and get into the Lord's church. Christ said, I will build my church, and friends, he did. If you are a member of the church the Lord established, then I will beg you with all of my being, do not leave the Lord's church and go back to the world. Do not leave the Lord's church and go join yourself to a denomination. Sometimes we misbehave and sometimes we hurt each other. I get it. Chances are real good if you've been a member of the Lord's church for any length of time, you've been on both sides of the aisle. Chances are good you have hurt somebody, and chances are good you've been hurt by somebody. But I beg you this. Don't leave the Lord's church because a member of the church hurt you. Saints were doing this in the first century and being tempted to do it, and that's why you're reading the epistles, and they are so urgent. Paul says there should be no division among us, 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 10. They're divided in calling. Paul said don't do that. In Galatians chapter 1, he said there are some perverting the church, they're perverting the gospel, and they're troubling you. He says, don't you go with them. Galatians chapter 3, he says, it'd be foolish. Oh, foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Colossians 2, James 5, 2 Peter 2, the book of Jude, Revelation, over and over and over again. There were some disciples on one occasion, heard some teaching from Jesus. They concluded in their mind, that's too difficult for us to follow. Those are hard sayings. And so the Bible says, from that day forward, they followed no longer with him. Undaunted, undeterred, Jesus turned to the apostles and he said, will you also go away? Peter, I pray that he spoke for us all when he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. If you understand the church, you will want to be a member. If you understand the church, you will never leave. Friends, I pray tonight, in some way, we've helped you understand and appreciate the good news that Jesus built his church. Would you believe that he is the son of God? Would you change your heart and your mind and repent? Would you at last confess his name boldly, loudly? I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And would you be buried with him in baptism and let him save you and add you to his church? Friends, if you've never done that, we beg you tonight to do that. Maybe you've wandered away. Maybe you didn't fully understand. Maybe you now know there is nowhere to go if we leave the body of Christ. We invite you to come, if we can help in any way, as we stand and as we sing.